Hi, Taylor Sappington. Welcome to the Health Coach Success Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to connect. Of course. Yeah, we're really excited to have you. I think you're going to be able to offer our listeners a whole bunch of um, information as to kind of what goes into being a health coach in the field. Uh, Before we dive into some particulars, um, why don't you share with our listeners kind of what in general you do on a day-to-day basis, what your practice is like, kind of what you do um, for the most part in a general sense. So similar to what we're doing here, right? I hop on Zoom. My practice is virtual. So I work with people from all over the globe. In practice these days, I offer small group coaching as well as test kit and consultations. We spend time on the phone in this platform, this video platform with education, guidance, tools, right? Insight, teaching people that their body is their best friend and that they can heal from the inside out. So um, I also spend time crafting and creating within my practice, whether it be the podcast or, you know, freebie giveaways. But generally speaking, as a practitioner, my time is spent educating because that's what this is all about. Yes. And knowledge for clients is power to change their life. And um, that's really what, what it's all about is giving our clients or really anybody the, the knowledge and the, the, I don't know, the wherewithal to kind of take things into their own hands. I tell my clients when we're in practice together, when we're spending time that the doctor of the future is actually the patient or in our case, the client. So the purpose of our time together is not for me to do the work for them. It's to do the work with them. You know, I'm going to be their guide. I'm going to be their compass and I'm going to be their biggest cheerleader. But at the end of the day, our role, at least the way I see it is to make sure that we are explicitly clear that the work is to be done by them and guided by us. So I always say I'm your guide, not your guru. I find it super offensive when someone's like, Oh, I'm like, no, I'm not a guru. I'm I'm a guide, you know, (laughs) very important. Yes. And that is, it might sound like, oh, I'm taking the focus off of, you know, my role and how much I'm going to support you, but it gives the power to them Mm -hmm. telling them like this, you have the power to do this. I'm going to give you the tools, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's going to change your life. You're the one that's going to change the course of where you're going and you can do that. I mean, I think it's a huge instill of confidence in in the client. Well, and most of the time, when they end up in practice with me, there's this degree of deflation, right? Because most of the time we're not the first stop on the train tracks. We're the last stop. And I always say to my clients, great, I can be stop 21, but I'm going to be your last stop. Like my goal going into this is to be your last stop. So I can teach you how to build your toolkit and I can teach you how to function independently. And I can teach you how to have a conversation from the perspective of being your own best advocate but I don't want you cycling or circling this drain that you've been circling up to this point. So it's like you're saying, it's about empowering them to know that they are going to be their own best advocate and that they're fully capable of doing it. Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. that's so important. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started. What were you doing before doing this? Have you been doing this forever? If you haven't, <laughs> how did you get here? <laughs> So I have not been doing this forever, at least not in this capacity. I went to school to be a dietitian. I spent a very, very short period of time in that role and very quickly and early on, thank God, I realized that it just did not align with what I wanted to do with people in a clinical capacity. I wanted to see forward moving progress. I wanted to support impactful change. And unfortunately, the guidelines or the scope that I was tied to and had to adhere to didn't allow for me to practice in an autonomous way. And that's something that I really crave. I like my autonomy. I like being able to relate to people as human beings, not as like practitioner to patient, which there's this sterile environment, at least through my lens that goes along with conventional practice. And I wanted to be able to remove myself from that sterile environment and create this dynamic environment where I could interact and meet people with where they were at and employ different things based on their bio individual needs. So I remained in a clinical setting. I, I played very like a variety of different roles in the clinical setting. So I've worked in rehabilitative and, you know, long-term care. I've worked in palliative care, you know, with patients who were passing, I've worked in cardiovascular care. So I've spent a lot of time in the clinical realm 
so that I could fund my education in this realm. That's why I stayed as long as I did. And I also strategically stayed so that I was able to visualize and get to know and familiar with where the gaps in care actually were. You know, I was on the front lines. I was working with people in the trenches in regards to patient care. And I got to see the frustrations of the patients and the limitations of what was being offered in the conventional setting. So it was really a blessing that I was able to stay in a variety of different roles in the clinical field that allowed me to educate myself and rub arms with some really smart people. I mean, I'm sure most people listening to this podcast learn through, you know, they vicariously learn through other people. It's how we learn with Dr. C, right? Like we're vicariously walking through life with him through the program. So I was able to do that with the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the PAs that I worked with, the RNs that I worked with too. So it was really nice to be able to maintain that stature while I was going to school. And for almost four years ago, I left for good the clinical field and I opened what is now tailored well-being. So and it was definitely an interesting start. So I've been doing this exclusively, this meaning working as a practitioner on virtual platforms for four years. But prior to that, I was very much in person, in clinical care, in a variety of different capacities. Okay. And yeah. so how did you kind of change your training of what was, you know, dietitian related and working in the more conventional field mm -hmm. to now uh, being a health coach. And I think, you know, being an integrative health practitioner and doing what we do, I think sometimes people are like, well, what do you do? And how did you get there? A million dollar so, question. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> what was your kind of pivot point of going from X education, you know, to Y and, and what was that like for you? So I consider myself lucky. And most people are like, what do you mean you consider yourself lucky? I was really sick. So it was in me experiencing my own hardships with health and the exposure that I got to naturopathic, you know, physicians and acupuncturists and functional medicine doctors and energy practitioners that led me or piqued my curiosity into the integrative health field. Right. And that started around age 20. So, and I had a lot of ebbs and flows with my own personal health. I had a lot of diagnoses handed over to me. I, um, I like to say I explored through a lot of different treatment options that did not serve and support my body in a capacity that was meant to allow for a failure, uh, like a thriving environment. I failed to thrive on many occasions at at the hands of conventional practitioners. Now this is, and I always say to people, I don't hate medicine. Like I love the advancements and the technology that have come along with conventional practice, but conventional practice, at least the way I see it is great for trauma-based injury. Most of us deal with chronic illness, you know, and autoimmunity and multiple points of origin. So it was through my own experience with chronic illness. And what do I mean by that? Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, irritable bowel disease, celiac, breast implant illness, Lyme and mold toxicity. Like I had a 10 mile long list of things that I just, you know, kept adding to with each doctor's visit that I went to that I was like, I'm not getting where I want to go with this approach. And I started exploring al alternative approaches as we like to call them. Right. And it was through my experience, my own personal experience with these quote unquote alternative practitioners that I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. Like I had an idea going into school for didactic practices that I wanted to help. And the body was fascinating. And I loved how you could implement and integrate dietary changes and see, you know, cause and effect but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So it was through my own personal experience that I was like, oh, okay, this is what I really want to do. So I look back and I go, yeah, was it painful to go through all of that? And did it make for a wild story? Absolutely. But it's what allowed me to start exploring, again, alternative modalities. And it's what ultimately led me to what I'm doing today in practice. Yeah. And it's such a common theme, mm -hmm. right, in our field of people just, they end up feeling unwell themselves. Yeah. They get answers and they are so passionate about conveying it to other people. And I believe that that's your, you know, it helped you get to where you wanted to be and, and help you to know what you mm -hmm. wanted to do, but it's also what makes you so great at what you do, right? You're able to relate to the people that are in that position yes. and the relatability 
in my opinion, is what builds the trust. It's what builds the the belief that the the client knows, okay, if she could get from A to B, well, so can I, and she's thriving. And then who knows that person might get just as inspired as you did to then do it. And we kind of just keep that, you know, ripple. It happens every day in practice. And I'm sure you see this too. We're like, I'll be wrapping up with a client and they'll be like, I really want to leave my profession and do what you do. And I'm like, bless you. Like (laughs) it's the biggest compliment because you're like, wow, this was so life-changing. I get it. Mm-hmm. It was so life changing that you now want to impart everything that you've want, learned to someone who needs your help. And that's a beautiful thing because I always say there are plenty of people that know that don't know they need our help. So they need our help, but they don't know we exist or they don't know they need our help yet. It will come in time, right? Because they'll get up and hit that metaphorical brick wall again and again and again and eventually get tired with it. But absolutely, I mean, I tell people you know, when someone goes, well, what's, what are your credentials? You know, I'm like, what is your education? And I'm like, well, I can run you through the long list of things that I've done for formal education, but my real credentials come from my experience. I call it the street cred, right? Like my street cred is super wicked. It's valid, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's because I got to go through everything that you're currently experiencing. And like you said, I'm here to tell you that this is not a life sentence. You don't have to live like this. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the the street cred. Give us a yes. little bit of um, the the formal. What kind of formal stuff did you end up doing to to get you to the point where you could you know speak so? Well, I did what every you know person looking to switch gears in the clinical field would do first. I was like, well, let me check out another program. I looked at NP, like RN and NP. I looked at PA. Eventually, I looked at going back for my ND you know, but there was something that just wouldn't allow me to pull the trigger on any of them, filled out the applications, you know, did what I needed to do in terms of testing. And there was no follow through on the back end. It was that intuitive guide saying, this is not really where you want to go. And this is not really what you want to do. So what I ended up doing was looking at the curriculum for the naturopathic program and peeling things apart what do I want to do from this curriculum that really calls to me, you know, and there were herbalism certifications that I sought and I, you know, obtained, there were functional courses that I sought and I obtained certifications in that psychological. So like positive psychology, I really love the psychology behind well-being. And it's such an overlooked piece of the puzzle. People don't realize that somatic healing is really important to your overall picture of wellness and care. So I just, I peeled apart the naturopathic program and took pieces and chunks that I really wanted to dive into. And that's mold literacy, hormone functionality. Like there were different things that I just went after individually. And ultimately one of the last programs that I've recently completed is IHP one and two, which was fantastic because that opened up a whole nother door in terms of testing. You know, like I had been looking at the testing and gunning after the testing. And this gave me the opportunity to not have to utilize an overseeing practitioner to order and run the testing. Yep. Yeah. What's your, what, I'm curious, what's your favorite part about the functional medicine lab testing that you're able to run from being an integrative health practitioner? God, watching people's face light up as I'm reading it. Like as you're going through and you're explaining everything line by line and you're like, oh my God, like they're like, they're sitting there like, wow, yes, yes, that's me. Oh my God. That's where that comes from. Just like the pure joy that comes from watching somebody for the first time in their life feeling validated. Yes. And even if it's news that's overwhelming to fix, which it always is, always, always. (laughs) yes, but they still feel so much relief that there's finally an answer because again, most people come into our realm when they, they have else no answers. Yes. And yeah. they're like, something is not right. Mm-hmm. Nobody has been able to tell me what is not right. And they're finally getting the validation that, yeah, you're, you're actually right. Something yeah. isn't right. And we can help you fix it. Yeah. It's such a tragedy to tell people that they're not hearing their body correctly. Right. Because mm-hmm. our body speaks a really particular language. And I tell this story in practice. I'm like, look, I have a kid. 
You know, as a mama, I know when my little guy needs something, he's probably going to throw a temper tantrum. When he's tired, he rubs his eyes. When he's upset, he falls to the floor and kicks around. You know, like we know the language of our children because prior to a certain age, there is no logic. So a lot of the communication comes through emoting. And then adults, we have conversations, hopefully. I always say we're big kids. So occasionally we might have a temper tantrum of our own, but the body only has symptoms to speak through. And if we're constantly turning turning the dial down on that radio, the body is going to constantly try and turn the dial back up just a little bit louder than the time before. So we can hear it. And these tests give us an opportunity to translate what the body is attempting to say in symptoms and make it into words that are easier to digest and tangible for the mind to wrap itself around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to learn to stop telling people that they don't know what their body is saying to them because they do know, they just don't know how to put it into words. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and knowing that just something isn't right, right? Not being mm-hmm. able to even, because some people can't even articulate it. I mean, my, my favorite is like stress. Are you stressed? And most people are like, no, <laughs> not much more than usual. Or, are you uh, sure? Yeah. Well, it's like, well, I think you maybe just aren't as aware, you know, because some yeah. people are super hyper aware of their bodies. Some people are not all that aware. And mm-hmm. so pulling out even the things that somebody might not be aware of, because you know that that's a particular strain on, on their system. And if you can kind of let them see that quantitatively, well, then they can, can do something about it. And it's, you know, evidence-based too, for the, for them to, again, take, take control of, of what's happening. Well, you say evidence-based, right? And so many people are like, well, these tests aren't approved by insurance. No, most of the time they're not. They're not quote unquote gold standard in the conventional realm either, but that doesn't mean that they're not data and they're not valid. Just Mm -hmm. because a large majority of a particular population hasn't been taught how to read and interpret results doesn't mean that they're irrelevant. If anything, I've come to find that they're much more relevant, especially when you build them into an entire baseline or picture of care. Sure. We can use blood work, but that's not going to be the gold standard for everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And your blood, I mean, your blood's a homeostatic fluid. It's going mm-hmm. to, it's going to look good. Yes. Um, unless something is really wrong yes. and things like, you know, your hair are going to tell us what your body's wasting. Saliva mm-hmm. is, is going to tell us, you know, what's, what's there for you. So it's, it's so much of this, uh, yes, blood testing is important in certain situations, but when you test more than just blood, you get a different picture. When you, you look a, at, yeah. yes, you get a really comprehensive picture and it's yeah. very cool to be able to fill in those gaps. You can't, I say you can't plug the, the holes in the bucket unless you know where the holes are, you right. know, and if you're getting labs that quote unquote, how many people get labs where it's like, everything's normal. And you're like, no, no, everything's not normal. My body's telling me it's not normal, but you're sent home very defeated with the advice of eating differently and exercising more. And you're like, well, that's what, okay, cool. Like that's what I came into this appointment for. You know, we have to be able to give people an opportunity or a channel to explore where they can gain further insight and information so that they can take proper steps to patch the hole. Yes. Yeah. And have someone caring who can relate and who can, like you said, guide Mm -hmm. their choice and their ability to do so is, you know, what I all, I always tell people is, is my goal. I'm kind of the, you know, I, I set the fire underneath and that kind of sets the balloon up (laughs) into the air and then the person's hard work kind of takes it from there. And so much healing comes from being seen and being heard so much. Yep. An and being, instant just guard let down, an instant like deflation of tension in the body. Like you said, I mean, I'm sure, you know, the clients' faces light up or I've had people cry. Mm-hmm. Or it, just the emotion that comes from hearing like it, we, we know, we know what might be causing this yeah. and we can help and you can fix this is a huge um, huge shift for so many people. I always love it too. People are like, can you guarantee? And I'm like, okay, so we don't guarantee around here. We, we (laughs) sit co-pilot to the body, right? The body gets to determine if, and when we need to pivot and what that pivot looks like. It's almost as if for the first time in someone's life, they realize just how frequently their body communicated with them and just how frequently they, they tuned it out. You know, pivots are, are very much a part of our practice, or at least that's what I've come to find. So I'm like, I can guarantee you're going to feel better 
but I cannot guarantee this is going to be an overnight success because I think a lot of people have this, you know, preconceived notion that healing is a quick process because we live in a society of instant gratification. And I always have to remind people, our body is not like our iPhone. We don't get text messages and respond within 30 seconds. Like the body is a very primal, you know, mechanism or vessel and it's going to work in its own time, but it's that time under tension and that consistency and the commitment to showing up to your why that gets people to feeling really good. Yes. Yeah. And it yeah. didn't get that. Those imbalances didn't happen overnight. Uh, and that's what I, you didn't get here in four days. So it's not going to unravel and, you know, get set back on your path in, in four days, it's going to take time. But, but the lasting change that happens from doing it in a way that really resolves root causes Mm -hmm. and fix things from the ground up, it, then you, then you have to stop. You don't have to chase it any longer. It's once you're at a certain point, then you maintain and you're not always chasing, um, symptoms and, and poor health people are always so shocked when I'm like, it takes seven to 10 years for an autoimmune condition to physically present itself. Like it's just, it's like the, the pile, right? Like how many, how many things can we pile up in the body where we ask it to compensate before it finally goes, the wheels on the bus are falling off and I can't keep up at this pace. Mm -hmm. I mean, seven to 10 years, the fact that we get that out of our body is mind blowing to me. I'm like, wow, talk about something that is constantly trying to show up and support you irregardless of what's going on in your life. Right. And then think about how often we get frustrated with the body for not doing what we want it to do. Like I always say, you cannot hate your way into healing because so many people show up frustrated. I'm like, no, 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 we don't make war anymore. We make peace with everything. Right. But even talking about infancy, I'm like, well, what was your childhood? Like people are like, why are we talking about what it was like when I was five? And I'm like, well, because you're 25 and it's important. Yes. Cause that's how you started here. <laughs> yes. Whether you believe it or not, it all started then. Mm-hmm. And it's not to blame mom and dad. Mom and did the da- dad did the best that they could. Mm-hmm. Right. It's more or less about recognizing that all of the things that we've been exposed to over the years eventually walked us into the seat that we're sitting in today. Yeah. But the cool thing is, is you get to change it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I all, one of my favorite sayings, it's never too late to be become what you could have been. And yeah. It, I see women in their seventies mm-hmm. you know, change, change their life around. It's really, it, it's a beautiful process to watch even as, as old as that might, might sound, you know, to some people like, Oh, why now? Because why, why not? not? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to know if you think it kind of takes a certain, you know, personality dynamic or, or some sort of character trait uh, within somebody to make a really good health coach and what, what that might look like. Yes. Without a doubt. It takes patience. First and foremost, it takes a lot of patience and empathy, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, it also takes the ability to be able to ask really good questions, right? We, we live in a world where we want to speak before the other person is finished sharing. And when you're a practitioner, your job is to really sit back and take in, like it is your client or your patient's job to provide you with the information. You're there to act as a sounding board and absorb the information. You're also there to provide proper guidance based on that information. But what I've come to find in my time owning a practice at this point too, is you have to have boundaries as well. Like when I started this entire journey, my boundaries were really questionable, meaning I was constantly showing up to pour into someone else's cup because I loved what I did so much. And I thought I was doing the right thing, but you have a year to a year and a half where your phone is on open access to people and you're getting text messages at all hours of the night and things like, gas and bloat have now become an emergency instead of just part of the process. And you learn really quickly that boundaries are a really important part of the overall practice too, not just for you, but in teaching your client how to be independent. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Not separating yourself from their needs, but rather giving, giving them the autonomy and almost not forcing them to trust themselves, but giving them the space to trust themselves. Because if you're constantly there Mm -hmm. to fix it or respond, it, it doesn't necessarily give them the tools to think about like, okay, what is my body saying? 
What do I need? Is it okay? Yeah. And without automatically reacting to get either your approval or your response or yes, your, your, yeah, absolutely. The boundaries are huge. One of the things that we do in practice is we monitor blood sugar. It's really important. It's a very easy to access piece of, you know, biofeedback. And it's something that's really critical in understanding not only what you're putting on your plate and consuming, but like where your energy is being spent throughout the day how stressed are you really? Right. You say you're not stressed, but mm, that glucometer that's reading 120 four hours after your meal is telling me something different. We either did not do the best with our food choices and we need to pivot with what's needed for your body, or we really need to get serious about having a come to Jesus with what stress really is, you know, but I'm sure, I'm sure you see this too, where people are like, you know, you make pivots during the functional medicine detox where you're like, okay, we'll do blueberries in your shake, or we'll pivot to days three through day seven, because it's just better for your body overall. And like, you still get the same questions four days later, like, well, is it okay if I, and I'm like, what, what did we talk about? What are your, (laughs) what are your biofeedback parameters telling you? It's learning, like you said, to trust your body and follow those cues. And that's a boundary for them that you're teaching. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that they can, when you're, cause inevitably I always say my job is to get you so well mm-hmm. and have you so educated that you don't need me forever. Yes. Come back, check in, Do get a, a you know, every, yes. Yeah. Like redo mm-hmm. your big fives every year. But the goal is really that the client is then so empowered, so well educated and so in tuned with their own body that they know when something's off, like, Hmm, that's weird. My gas, my bloating's back. Maybe I should run a lab. And so that they're not constantly relying on you to direct their every single move. Yeah. I tell everybody we're not in this for repeat business. Exactly. Yes. Because it's not a revolving door. Yep. And you know, you, you did your job. If, Mm -hmm. if somebody is kind of well off and, and thriving and doesn't necessarily, you know, come back to needing you every month. And that doesn't mean that things aren't going to go off track. That's the other thing that I think is really important to highlight. We are human beings. Mm -hmm. We are exposed to something that I like to call human error. We all know what it is, right? Like we went a little wild on vacation or we had a few months that just did not go well at work or insert the blank. And your body is this dynamic ecosystem that's constantly changing. Like you and I have talked about, and it's really important to recognize that just because something comes up in the future doesn't mean that you failed or what you did didn't work. Right. It just means we have a new change in a new ecosystem that needs a new set of eyes and new test results and maybe a pro maybe a protocol or just perhaps a few pivots. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And, and the, you know, the habit type of stuff that, you know, gets people sometimes to the imbalance in the first place, whether it's, you know, not sleeping great or Mm -hmm. the stress or, you know, having food off their kid's plate or eating too late at night, you know, sometimes those stuff, those things can sneak back in. And for the first, you know, four or five, six months, it's not an issue. Not a big deal. Right. And then the accumulation, you know, one year later, and sometimes people just need a little help to, okay, we need to reset you. Here's the path. Sorry, you ended up over here. We need to put you straight that way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they just need somebody to help, you know, get them, get them back on the path. And the reset is usually really quick, like comparatively speaking, you know, we look at the reset and we go, Oh, that was a way less painful than we thought it was going to be. You know, there's that fear factor though. People are always afraid of going back to where they started. I'm like, that's impossible with the Mm -hmm. steps you're taking forward. Of course. Yeah. Cause you're, you're really getting to the root of how things got so out of hand to begin with. And when you work from the bottom up, and you're not just masking the symptom, Mm -hmm. then the bottom doesn't have its chance to rear its ugly head when the supplement stops fixing the symptom or the medication stops fixing the symptom. Yeah. It's called root cause medicine for a reason. Um, Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, did you have particular roadblocks, anything that, you know, sticks out as a struggle when you were going from A to B, you know, from your more clinical practice to what you're doing now? I mean, obviously time and finances were without a doubt, something that was a very obvious, it's why I stayed in my line of um, work. Everything happens for a reason though. Right. So, I mean, outside, 
I wanted to do it. So the roadblocks were really not roadblocks for me, if that makes sense. I just found a way to make everything fall into place. So I either financed it or budgeted everything that I wanted to pay for in terms of education. At one point I was a single mom. So it it meant a lot of late nights, which these days I'm like, Taylor, we could have planned that a lot better knowing what I know now about like the importance of sleep and it dictating the quality of your life. Um, but you know, and then obviously my personal health struggles, I didn't always have the mental capacity or the physical energy to show up and do everything that I needed to do, especially when I was in a particular treatment plan, right? Lyme is something that I was treat quote unquote treated for. I put that in quotations, right? I met a Lyme literate doctor. He was functional in nature, previously conventionally trained. He was fantastic, but I was on antibiotics, three different kinds for nine and a half months. I mean, to treat three different co-infections reflectively, I would never do that again, but you learn as you go. Um, so I didn't always have the mental, the emotional and the physical capacity to do what I needed to do in terms of showing up and prepping myself for the life that I absolutely wanted to live. But there was a purpose to that too, you know? Yeah. And if there was one thing that stands out as the way that you kind of overcame those things, what, what do you think it would be as far as, I don't know, su- support or is there something or what could have just been your drive? Yeah. I'm <laughs> so drive. stubborn. Yeah. I am so <laughs> stubborn. So like, if I want, if I want to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, it was, I wish I wasn't as stubborn because sometimes I push too hard, but I, I wanted to do this. It's so interesting because when people speak to me, whether it's a client in practice or somebody that's, you know, talking about potentially working with me, they're like, wow, you're like really where you should be in life. Because when you show up to a call, it's very obvious you love what you do. And I'm like, we should all be this happy about walking into work, right? Like I don't consider this work. I consider it my passion project. So once I had a taste of what it was like to do something that really didn't light my fire, and then I would get into the the classroom setting. Right. And I would start exposing myself to the things that really took my interest. I was like, there's no way I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of time. Yes. Yeah. And reflectively, it took me way longer than I wanted it to, but here we are. Right. Yes. And time uh, getting, getting where you, where you want to be. I mean, the process of getting there inevitably teaches you something. And once, once you're there, Mm-hmm. And, and you're still the, the thing with this field, right? Is like, it's ever evolving. We're always learning, even when we're doing what we know we want to be doing. There's still so much that kind of swirls in our heads about, you know, how could I do this better? How could I reach more people? How could I, you know, be more, you know, in, in front of, again, to, to empower more people. And so I think that all kind of accumulates and, and you end up where you're supposed to be, like you said. It's so interesting too, because I tell everybody who's hopping into a program, I'm like, look, I know our time together was magical and beautiful and that's the way that it should have been. And I love that you're starting on this path to never stop learning. Like I tell them, Mm -hmm. find a niche or find something that really, you know, engages their attention and explore that more. Because when you find things that really light your fire, so to speak, your practice is going to reflect that too. So always be perpetual student of life. I tell all of my clients that and people who want to move on to functional and integrative health practices. I'm like, always be a student because you'll do a certification here or a certification there. There will always be more to learn always. Yep. Mm -hmm. Of course. And okay. So on that note, um, other than things like the IHP or like brain barrel effect, is there a specific book that you absolutely love, a specific author or somebody that totally speaks to you from an educational or just like a standpoint, I could go full spectrum with this. Cause I like mm. all sorts of books. So like from the esoteric and etheric perspective, I love Caroline Mace, you know what I mean? And all of her work or Marianne Williamson. Um, I love Dr. Ben Lynch and his work because I think genetics, it's important to understand that stuff, but also knowing that there's a lot that you can do to help. So he's incredible. Nicholas Gonzalez is an 
OG physician that looked at um, nervous system function. You've got Tom Cowan. I could sit here and talk to you all day about the people that I absolutely love to follow because there are so many of them. And I think reading and constantly stimulating, you know, your interest and other information is really important in staying relevant in your field too. You of know. course. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. people are, you know, everything is constantly evolving mm-hmm. and it's, yeah, I, I agree. Staying relevant is super important. What about if people were wondering like, should I become a health coach? Like what would it, you know, what would it look like? What should I do it? Do you have inspiration, general, like inspirational type of thoughts for somebody who's thinking about doing this? So I would always ask intention and why behind it. Like, why do you want to become a health coach and what impact do you want to make on the world and how can you do that? Right. So I think it's really important to sit with why you want to show up to this field and what you want to bring to this space. But I also think that life needs more people running towards their passion with fire under their feet. And if somebody's being called and compelled to hop into this line of work, that it's really important to answer the call right? Because we have enough people that go to work every day from nine to five. And this isn't knocking anyone who don't love what they do. And they're on autopilot and they just go through the emotions and life needs more people that are like, yeah, I'm I'm here to help. And I want to help. And I'm here because I want to be here. And I have the experience of building this entire practice, right? Which also leads into how you show up as a practitioner. Because you literally craft an environment that you can offer to your clients where you're like, hey, I put all my time, love, attention, and care into creating this experience because I want it to be beautiful for both of us. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really important to answer that call, you know, and then decide how you want to move forward in answering that call. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, if we wanted to, you know, the listeners wanted to find you on <laughs> social we, media, God, Wait, it I know it's so fast. Like this time is just, yeah, I know. Um, if listeners wanted to find you on social media mm-hmm. or where, where can listeners tune in to, to hear you hear what you have to offer? I'm constantly getting in trouble on Instagram at tailored wellbeing. You can find me there. Um, I love to have conversations on the podcast that I'm now hosting called tailored talks. I'm on Facebook, but I can't say that I spend a lot of time on Facebook. So I do have a tailored wellbeing page on Facebook. It's constantly being updated with information that I'm essentially transposing from Instagram just to make sure all audiences are getting the same educational information that I'm attempting to impart into and on the world. So those are the three primary places that people can find me. Okay. That's awesome. This was such a fun conversation. And honestly, you are such a a light with, you just light up with passion and I can see why your clients always feel so, so motivated and um, enlightened in your presence. It, It really is. Thank you so much for allowing me to share some of what makes me super happy with you and this audience. I hope everybody took something away from it. So I appreciate you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. And um, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks for being on the Health Coach Success Podcast, Taylor. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.